This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. man back in the saddle again and i'll tell you i'm not going on vacation again for at least a year <laughs> um everybody's here right we're here yeah we're all here <laughs> we're here present <laughs> we, uh, we have not been on vacation yeah, with that. you guys. Yeah, JD is the only one that left town, but uh, yeah, cry me a river. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, you know, going on vacation is supposed to be one of these relaxing, enjoyable experiences. You know, where you get to sit around with a glass of your favorite brew or wine and just kind of take in the sights. That's not the case at all. So. Uh, don't be fooled by, uh, you know, going on vacation, leaving town, because it's a lot of work. Sure. Um, I, um, hey, this is the Mead House. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, you know what this show's all about. I mean, it's just four guys. Uh, we sit around talking about making good meat at home. That's where it's all going to start for you. Um, and, uh, we try to push the envelope a little bit and, uh, see what we can come up with and, uh, you know, doing it right, of course. Uh, but the fun thing about making mead is it's so experimental. You can pretty much put your own ideas into it as long as you've got a good plan, a good method and really come out with something, uh, something good to start off, uh, tonight, guys, I got to throw this shout out to Weston. Naraki. He might even be listening tonight uh, of Manzanita Roasting Company at Ber uh, Bernardo Winery in Poway, California, down in San Diego County. Uh, I talked to him at length about roasting coffee and about wine making and mead making. I brought home some of his roasted coffee that uh, I may end up trying uh, in a coffee mead that Chris and I are going to kind of talk about here a little bit later on this idea that we were tossed around before I left town and then another shout out I don't know if you guys caught this uh, on the Mead Facebook it's a post uh, by Bob Stans he's got these pictures of these freshly dumped bourbon barrels what a find uh, that he's apparently going to age some mead in oh man what I love to get my hands on one of those what do you think? I think so. I think the right meat in a bourbon barrel would be a, a really tasty thing. You know, I've, um, with some pretty decent results, I have taken small batches and tried out, uh, you know, soaking uh, wood chips in bourbon and then, uh, Put, you know, draining them and then putting those chips in into some meat. I've done it in ciders, and it's an amazing flavor. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you don't have the barrel, uh, you can always try that. So, but, and I've uh, used wood chips and staves on in mead before, and I concur. It's a, it actually gives it a very nice flavor. Um, yeah. And we'll talk about that more tonight, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Martin in the house with us, Mississippi Chris. Uh, you just heard Jeff Schaus talking at you. Of course, uh, me, they uh, they call me J.D. Uh, even my mother called me J.D. But um, we have an app for that. If you go to the meathouse.com, you can download our app, take us with you, listen live. We also have a Facebook uh, deal out there. It's just simply the Mead House. We don't do the Twitter thing. I'm sorry. Uh, JD just doesn't. How do you, what do you, what's it called? Tweet? I Tweet. guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not you one of those. Yeah, I'm not one of those Donald Trump types that, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night and has to tweet something or re retweet or whatever the hell he does. Uh, the call in number, if you want to call the show, talk to us, uh, 818 921 4680. 818 921 
four six eight zero. Hey, put it on the speed dial if you have to. We'd love to talk to you. Um, is that a new? Uh, I can't. Was that in the notes before, guys? Jason Peralt. <laughs> Or did somebody add that? Was that a shout out we were supposed to do? Um, I got this. I got this note in here. Jason Peralt. So you want to make Mead poster at Mead Facebook? Sort of whacked out. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, there was a picture that Jason Peralt uh, had, uh, as I recall now, from a couple of weeks ago in the Mead Facebook. It was sort of this whacked out looking roadmap on how to make mead. I don't know if you guys saw that. I think I might have saved it. I'll have to put it up on the website. Yeah, yeah. It was like a flow chart. Yeah. I remember right, that yeah. too. Yeah, I saw yeah. that as well. Oh, man. I started looking at that. And, I, and I, at first, it kind of it kind of looked confusing. And I thought, okay, oh, it is confusing. <laughs> but uh, yeah. that, was a, that was pretty cool. Um. What are we drinking tonight, guys? Aaron, what are you drinking? So tonight, I've got this Fever Dream Mango Habanero IPA from the Flying Dog Brewery out of Maryland. Pretty solid brew here. Anyone out there is a, an IPA fan as I am, um, definitely I would recommend this. And don't be intimidated if, if you're – not a huge fan of spicy flavors. The the habanero flavor is is pretty subdued, actually, compared to some other hot pepper beers and ales that I've tried before. Um, and, and it just definitely has a good kind of citrusy, hot profile, good malt backbone going on. So definitely a solid beer. Wow, sounds good. Jeff, what do you got going on, bud? I'm uh, I cracking open a bottle of Diamond Head Wines Plum Delightful. It's a uh, I ran into this guy at Grand Lake Renaissance Festival a couple weekends ago um, while I was out in Oklahoma, and he's a local guy. He does uh, most of his meads and wines with local Oklahoma fruit, uh, and this one is actually made of sand plums, if I'm not mistaken. Um, a lot of the, the the two brews of his that really caught my eye were this one and another one he does with passion flowers. Um, which best I can tell are regarded more as a weed than anything else. So I thought it was really cool that he's basically repurposing these fruits and making something really delightful out of them. What, what What's a sand plum? Uh, uh, best I can tell, it's some kind of a, a plum species that grows out in uh, in Oklahoma, kind of on a shrub from what I've heard. I could be wrong here, but... One of those... Uh... Like the uh, like the prickly pear of California. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever dealt with those before. Those, they're not the easiest fruit to have to deal with to make a wine out of. I'll tell you. <laughs> no, but I had some cordial from prickly plum on my honeymoon, and that was interesting too. <laughs> Chris, uh, you know, Chris is doing a pretty decent job of talking at us during the uh, pre-show before we got started here. I, I know he's uh, probably hurting a little bit tonight, but did you manage to? Uh, Get anything into a glass other than some painkiller, or what do you what do you got? Oh no, you you bet I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you bet. Uh, yeah, uh, dry peach melomel. Oh wow! Uh, homemade, good stuff. Yeah, Ooh. enough said. <laughs> now, what kind of peaches did you use? Uh, yellow Georgia peaches. Yellow Georgia peaches. Are those are those the uh, the stone thing? There's like uh, what do they call that? Stone fr- not stone tree. What do they call that? There's one um, where, the, where the seed like sticks to the damn meat. You can't get the seed out. And then, no, you're like, talking about free stone. Yeah, yeah. Is it is it that? Yeah, these are free stones. Yeah. Okay. Georgia peach. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well. Um, yeah, I, I, I've kind of lost track of our orange blossom mead. I know we're like way into it now. Uh, I think we've already racked it at least once or twice, and probably by now in the clearing process, I would imagine. Maybe not ready to bottle yet, but what, I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, could we be ready to bottle this thing? It was. Uh, uh, 
started uh, what six, uh, almost eight, uh, eight weeks ago. So, um, it's going to depend on clearing. Um, if it's clear, you can bottle it. Uh, if you did everything right, it's probably ready to drink. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if it's not clearing right now, you can you can hustle it along a little bit. There's a uh, an agent out there that I've used in the past, and I don't know how you guys feel. I, I don't particularly like doing this. I'd rather have it clear on its own, but I have used this stuff called Super Clear. It's a two, and I hate to use the word chemical, but uh, for lack of a better word, two chemical addition uh, you put one in first that's supposed to take care of the negatively charged particles and uh, then you wait an hour and put the other one in and mix it up that's supposed to take care of the positively charged particles and it all settles to the bottom and, and it works brilliantly so have you guys ever used uh, something like that uh, yeah I've actually used the super clear myself um, and got great results with it Um by the way, these are natural additives, more or less. I forget exactly what the the first one, the Cleosol, is made from, yeah. uh, but the Chitosan is the second step, and that's actually derived from uh, uh, from shellfish. But it's it's been processed enough that people with shellfish allergy shouldn't have a reaction to it, yeah. from what I've heard. Yeah, I don't want to scare anybody off. I mean, it, these are not toxic things that we're adding here, but. Uh... Uh, Chris, have you ever used anything uh, along that lines, or are you uh, old school? Yeah, I've used um, I've used that one, and I used uh, uh, one called um, Hot Mix Sparkaloid, Sparkle. and the uh, the KC findings, um, I believe, are superior. Yeah, um, oh. and I didn't notice any loss of flavor. What, what about using – I've heard different schools of thought on the use of bentonite, too. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on using bentonite? Mm. Commonly you used know, in the winemaking industry. And, you know, the first uh, mead maker that I met years and years and years ago swore by for clarifying his meads. Um, I've never tried it myself. I hear you get some flavor loss from it. But I, that's anecdotal at this point. I don't have any experience on my own to back it up. Yeah. Well, I just you know, I've heard both sides of it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, another one, and another one you could add to the list though is plain gelatin. Um, plain mm-hmm. gelatin, like you buy uh, in the supermarket gelatin. Exactly. Oh, really? Yep. Knox gelatin. Oh, wow. You just mix it up and uh, dump it in, and you you let it bloom in some warm water, and uh, uh, get it into your your fermenter. I forget exactly the steps, uh, but I, I read about this in Steve Piazza's book uh, on wine making. I'm sorry, mead making. Um, and yeah, I did. I used that in one of my batches as well before I hit it with Super Clear um, because I, I think I actually over oaked it and one of the things you have to be careful of is you can lose some some of the uh the tannin and um uh oaky character um from a mead um when you treat it with the gelatin and that was kind of what i was going for (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i have read where um it seems like the gelatin does a you may end up with more flavor loss from the gelatin um which you know like in your case may be a good thing well, and I've seen, uh, you know, in some of the websites and, and articles that have dealt with uh, mead recipes dating back, you know, several hundred years, I've even uh, seen where they've used egg, uh, egg white. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that works, but, uh, you know. I guess it works the same way as gelatin does. Uh, I think you pour it, float it on top, and wait for it to sink. I guess, and it's supposed to attract all the particles and uh, take it down with it, huh? Yep. <laughs> I prefer my... I've never egg. had any experience in, with either, any of that, though. I mean, to be honest, I've only used the other two once each. Yeah. Um, 
I've been I've considered myself lucky. I've, everything I've ever made just about cleared. Well, and I, you know, I prefer my eggs to be cooked uh, anyway, but. Uh, you know, I really, I don't know if you could call me old school or whatever, but uh, I, I prefer to try to get it clear all by itself on its own. Mm -hmm. I'm willing yeah. to wait, uh, you know, without having to put, uh, I, I'm, I guess you could call me kind of a chemical freak. I just, I don't like putting chemicals and odd things that really don't sound like they should belong there. Uh, I prefer to let it do it on its own. If it takes a couple of extra months, then hey, you know, so uh, so it takes a couple of extra months, you know. And can I make a can I make just a quick comment about what you just said? Sure. Uh, and this is uh, you know, I could easily get on a soapbox about this, but I'm not going to. Uh, I, I've heard people say, you know, I don't want to use sulfites because it's chemicals and I don't want to use sorbates or I don't, you know, I want you to think about something. Uh, you're, you're drinking something with one of the most uh, deadly chemicals known to the human body, which is called alcohol. Alcohol. You already have, <laughs> you already have one of the worst chemicals that you can put into your body uh, sulfites are not going to hurt you <laughs> unless you're allergic to them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, think about that before you worry about what you use in your meat. Well, then I'm going to die from alcohol poisoning because I, I, I got, I got a lot of wine sitting around the house and a lot of, of mead too. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. And, of course, you know, I mean, who else but a doctor would, would come up with something like that? Well, I mean, it's true. It's one of the, alcohol is one of the most toxic substances that's, that's routinely consumed on purpose. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Nothing you're going to use in the way of findings or stabilizers or anything is going to come close to, yeah. <laughs> to alcohol. So. Well, yeah, and we're, you know, I mean, and we're consumers of it. So, you know, I mean, I, I would have never have looked at it that way. Aaron, would you have, uh, I mean. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a good point. I, I think, um, you know, the the key point I would think of is just all things in moderation. And, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, not, so, Okay. So I don't I don't feel so bad then adding things like super clear and <laughs> I mean, well I'm looking I'm looking at it just purely from a toxicity standpoint yeah. and you know none of the other stuff you, you know unless you have a severe allergy to to sulfites or something uh, I mean we're assuming you, you're not allergic to it. Um, the toxicity from those things is nowhere close to to that of alcohol. Yeah. So, and the amounts you're using are nowhere close to the amount of alcohol in the drink. So, uh, yeah. you know, if you're you're talking about making something that's, you know, I've heard people say, "Well, I'd like to keep my meat organic," uh, and you know, <laughs> it's yeah. alcohol. Come on, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Organic poison. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you know, on this trip to North Carolina, we did manage to bring home some of the real deal moonshine made by a cousin of of uh, my buddy's wife, and uh, we managed to get it into a. Uh, we emptied out one bottle of this stuff called Midnight Moon. It's a commonly and it's not real. I mean, if you're a moonshiner from, from that country, this midnight moon stuff and, and things that you find in liquor store, they don't call that moonshine out there, believe me. Um, it's more like an unrefined whiskey. But the real deal, uh, we managed to come home. We, we actually emptied out this, this one bottle, put it in a quart jar, and I put the quart jar of the real deal in back in the bottle and uh, I put it in a suitcase, and I told my wife, I said, "Hun, this may not make the entire suitcase may not even make it home." 
So uh, we had some other wine that we collected out there at some wineries and, and whatnot. And, uh, I, you know, like I said, I told her, be forewarned. Uh, we may be downstairs collecting our luggage, and that one's just not going to come down to shoot. But it did. Uh, we picked it up, brought it home, and uh, lo and behold, TSA did open up the suitcase because inside was their little little tag, uh, you know, uh, inspected by TSA. And I thought for sure they would have pulled that because we just – the bottle of moonshine had this cork top in it. I told Jeff, I said, you need to – we need to tape that up, seal it up somehow. So he brought some of this Gorilla tape and taped it all up and everything. And uh, we put it in the suitcase like that in a, in a uh, like a Ziploc bag. And uh, I'd be damned if that thing didn't make it all the way home. Uh, so my wife has this bottle of real deal moonshine. And, yeah, you talk about alcohol, it's like 300 proof. I mean, it's like the real stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, it's, awesome. It's a, it's a long ways from the midnight moon and, and stuff that you find uh, that they call moonshine in liquor stores. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so, um, I thought we'd yeah, talk about... Uh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, some of the guys around here, uh, you, you should get some of their moonshine. Um, yeah. You, know, you, you have to drink it straight out of the still because they can't find anything to keep it in. It eats through everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Um I thought we'd spend a little bit of time talking tonight about aromas and flavors, tannins, mouthfeel. I mean, I think I think there's a lot to be said, and we may not even be able to do it all in one show. Um, but I feel that this is a very important part of making a good mead at home, and I think it's something that people really probably don't consider, uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, I mean, when you started putting all your meads together and getting involved in this, was that a consideration right off the top, or had you done enough homework to, to know that, you know, eventually you're going to have to wind up with a good mouthfeel uh, when it gets to the drinkable stage? You know, I was initially just concerned with making something that was delicious for my friends to drink. I, I had no idea about tannins and mouthfeels and stuff like that. Yeah. And did you, I mean, when it, when you did discover it, did it change anything about the way you made your meat or, or put your recipes together at all? Or? Um, a little bit. Yeah. The, especially the, the tannin and, um, um, acerbic nature, um, acerbic, um, no, the, the, the tannin part of it, um, kind of opened up this, um, how do I want to say this? It, it, it kind of was the, the, the light bulb moment of that's what's missing from this. That's, that's why this isn't tasting quite as good as it could. Um, and then I figured out you know, there are, there are definitely ways you can add to a mead to get that tannin flavor in it that you're looking for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know, I know Chris likes to use vanilla beans on occasion. I do. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I've experimented with, um, all sorts of additives to increase and decrease uh, mouthfeel and, and tannin structure. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've almost come to the conclusion that uh, I like using products that are uh, natural additives like vanilla beans or uh, bananas or something like that. Uh, they use them at a level so that uh, you don't really get the flavor. You just get the the, uh, the essence of it, more or less. Um, and and it's, been, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, likewise with, with tannins. Um, you know, I, I like grape skin tannins. Um, I think they're, they, they have an extra dimension to them that some of the oak tannin doesn't have. Um, but you know, there again, it all comes down to the style and, um, it's some degree of experimentation and what you prefer. 
Um, well, and in, uh, and in additions can be tricky because um, different needs will hold on and bind to tans differently, and some will precipitate out, some will remain. So getting the level just right takes a, takes some practice. Well, and isn't it one of those things that, you know, once you put it in, you can't really take it back? Uh, you know, I mean, if if you add too much, you're kind of stuck, you know? Not necessarily. Uh, depends on how, how much, too much you went. You know, how, how far overboard did you go? Uh, like I said, the, the tannins, to some degree, are going to, some will precipitate out slowly some will precipitate out fairly quickly um as the finding agents will remove some tannins some that won't um and, you know so there yeah there's a lot to consider there uh, one of the things that i have found is the difference between um uh, melomels and traditional needs uh, when it comes to tannins um i can stand tannins in a sweet traditional I don't like a high tannin content in a sweet melomel mm-hmm. uh, that just comes back to my personal taste however so yeah <clears throat> well how would uh, how would you even describe mouthfeel I mean what you know I really I'm, I'm kind of tasting even wines and beers uh, uh, you know, for the first time, really. I mean, I've been drinking them for a lot of years, but you really don't think about what you're drinking until you get involved in something like wine making, beer making, and you know, brewing that kind of thing. Uh, and now suddenly, I find myself with every sip analyzing what I'm actually tasting. Uh, how would how would uh, Aaron? How how would you describe mouthfeel? To somebody, you know, when when I think about mouthfeel, to me, it's almost like the the weight of the the drink in your mouth, if that makes any sense. And I, I'm probably off base with this, but the you know the ways I would describe mouthfeel is very you know something might be very delicate or light in body, um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you know, something might be real kind of heavy or or robust tasting and, and just kind of the way that, that it feels in in your mouth almost. Yeah. I don't I think, think you're off base by saying uh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're all right. I, I was just saying, Aaron, I don't think you're off base by saying weight. I, I, I kind of agree with you there. It's It's almost the perception of heaviness or like viscosity of the liquid too. Yeah. 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 Compare a Dr. Pepper to Gatorade. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, there you go. That's a light body and a heavy body. Yeah. So. <clears throat> well, and I, you know, I kind of look at it. Uh, you know, for me, it, it, there's like it's like three things. One, it it's got that heaviness, almost chewy. Uh, thick uh, feel to it, and then the 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 parts that I like, uh, the middle part to me would be uh, if it goes down like a bourbon. Uh, I want that little bit of alcohol burn, but I want to be able to taste, actually taste and feel what I'm drinking, and I get that from a really nice bourbon, and then. The other end of the spectrum is like a glass of Kool-Aid where it just goes down and that's it. And uh, you really don't get anything out of it. You get a, you get nothing left but a cotton mouth almost. Uh, it's that happy medium in between where, where I can taste it, I can feel it. And maybe that's why they call it mouth feel, I guess. Uh, but I guess there's a different ways can look at it. I think the mouthfeel is is intricately linked to the complexity. Uh, I think the overall complexity is what determines the mouthfeel for me. Um, of course, the drying, the cotton mouth, 
that you were talking about, that's going to be mostly your tannins. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and just the overall complexity. If there's a lot going on, uh, if, if you've got some sweetness that's sort of dancing around with some tartness and you've got some... Uh, some tannin structure and, you know, you've got the acidity there and uh, lots of flavor coming from all different ingredients. That's what kind of adds all this complexity and, and increases the mouthfeel. And it's one of those things where you look at the meat in the glass and it looks thick when you swirl it mm-hmm. and it feels thick in the taste, but it's actually no thicker than any other drink. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the art part of it. Uh, you know, that, and that's probably the part that I'm missing because, you know, my wife and I like to go wine tasting, and I stand there at the counter and I watch these guys, you know, they, they, they pour the wine in the glass and then they start swirling this thing around and they're staring at it, tilting the glass, looking at it, and and I'll, and I'll take a little bit of a sip and kind of swish it around in her mouth. And, and they go through this whole big production, you know, me. I, I take a big, good swig of it, put it in my mouth, hold it there for a minute. If it tastes good on the front and it tastes good on the back, and then I get this nice feel after I swallow it all down and I like it, then to me, that's a good wine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't need to go through this whole rigmarole of, you know, watching the legs drip down the, the side of the glass and swirling all this. And, you know, mm-hmm. I do take a good, nice, big whiff of it. I, I do like to do that. I like to smell what I'm tasting. Um, I think aroma uh, has a lot to do with the finished product. Uh, along with this mouthfeel, we're talking tannins and stuff. Uh, what about the aroma and flavor that kind of goes along with it, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think aroma and flavor need to be in balance. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and how do you get that, to that point? Jeff is the judge. He probably has <laughs> better opinions on that. Um and isn't he the third, the third, the world, third world's best? How, how did you? Play? No, he's he's the uh, top one and a half meat oh. makers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> how would you? Uh, how would you link that up? How, how would you determine uh, aromas and flavors, Jeff? Oh, aromas and flavors are a little bit tough to call. Um, as far as like what I want in body and like mouthfeel and balance, it, it is, it's very much balance. Um, it, I, when I go in to smell a mead, I want to, I want to be able to get aromatics from everything going into it. I want to get some of that, the floral character of the honey or whatever kind of varietal character of the honey is there. I want to get some of the ingredients in there. Um, and, yeah, I, I I am a little bit uh, snobby. I'll do the the tilt in the glass and swirling it around and trying to get the uh, the different volatile aromatics to to pop out in different ways, so I can uh, I can get a full kind of spectrum of what's going on. Um, but yeah, no, I want uh, I want to I want a mead that smells nice because I don't think it's going to taste good off the bat if it doesn't smell nice first. Um, and I. You know, I, I want a mead that can follow it up with the good flavor as well. Um, it, if the, the ar- aromatics are really good, but the flavor is just kind of bland and a little meh, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed with it. <laughs> yeah. so they, they do have to be in balance. So, Jeff, you, you touched on something that, that's kind of interesting to me about if there are different aromas going on in that mead in terms of the different ingredients that were used, the floral characteristics of the honey or, or different things like that. It, to me, it's almost like indicating that you're looking for a an aroma that matches the flavor. 
what are, what do you guys think about a meat if uh, you know where you've got a situation where the aroma doesn't match the flavor and you know you're smelling different things than than what you're tasting mm-hmm. I don't think it's so much that it has to match um, I think it just has to be on a on an equal footing uh, I don't want to smell a big huge fruit aroma and then have very little fruit flavor. Uh, if there's a, I think if there's a big aroma, there needs to be big flavor. Uh, you know, if the aroma is light, then a light flavor is fine. Um, but, you know, when we talked about oxidative and reductive ferments, that's where a lot of this comes in, in creating this balance of aroma and flavor. And I said then, I said, you know, I don't like to be, uh, promised something by the aroma and then disappointed by the flavor. Uh, I want the flavor to deliver what the aroma promises. Yeah. That's a good way so to it, put it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. it's not necessarily the, the match of flavor to the aroma, but just the, like you say, the equal footing and having a, a strength of aroma that matches the strength of the flavor. Yeah, right. an equal intensity, I think. Yeah. Um, because you're inevitably going to get some different kinds of aromas that are different from the flavors. Um, yeah. There's going to be some that are the same, and there's going to be some that are different. Um, and and that really a lot of that comes into the the oxidative and reductive ferments. Yeah. Well, and then you know, all all of your you know when you consider the recipe whatever that you're throwing into it. I mean, you know, we, it's always been said that more fruit is better, say, in a melomel. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily the case either because uh, it may be possible to, you know, put the 40 pounds of fruit in a five-gallon batch, but the finished product, you know, may come out tasting like a watered-down Kool-Aid. Uh, and, you know, getting to what Chris is talking about, you know, I, I don't want a big smell. I don't want this big berry aroma. And then my first sip, it tastes like a watered down Kool Aid, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. but I, and then how do you get to that balance? How, how do you achieve that balance? That's probably the biggest question uh, on anybody who's listening. Uh, I think, um, certainly, it's going to be their next question, right? Well, my answer would be experimentation. Uh, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as, as much as I believe in having lots of fruit, you know, I like the fruit bombs. Uh, you can overdo fruit. There is no doubt about it. You can overdo it. Yeah. Uh, especially with the really tart things, you can, you can most definitely overdo it. Uh, you, you can get it so tart, so acidic that it's just impossible to balance and, and end up with anything reasonable to drink. Yeah. Uh, now some of the milder fruits, you do really have to go overboard with them. Uh, this peach, for instance, uh, you, you can't make a good heavy bodied or even a medium bodied uh, need with, with any decent peach flavor unless you really load it up with peaches. Yeah. Uh, but there again, now we're getting into style. Maybe you don't want a heavy body. Maybe you don't want a strong peach like I do. Maybe you want just a hint. So, yeah. you know, it all comes back to determining right off the bat, what do I want to make? What's my end goal? Right. And, and, you know, so um, well, when somebody says a melomel to me, I automatically think fruit bomb because that's what I like. But they may be thinking, uh, you know, just a hint. Like crisp. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've, ha- I've had the light and crisp type meads from some, some of the meaderies that, uh, uh, you know, that have sent me samples uh, when we were doing the other show. And some of them have been very light, very refreshing, almost a summertime under the umbrella at the beach type 
drink, but then some of them have been so sweet that it would be a short glass with a cheese plate or a fruit plate at, at the end of your dinner, you know, uh, like a nice port wine. <laughs> um, yeah. And I promise I, I won't go off on the port one that I acquired. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and, and I think uh, well, this is you know one of the fun things about doing this show. I mean, this this whole thing is about experimenting with with mead making, and I I quite enjoy this. Um, you know, being able to produce a, a drinkable alcohol at home uh, using different kinds of, of added, you know, uh, honeys, uh, fruits, uh, whatever you want to put into it. I mean, I'm eager to start, uh, you know, Jeff had, was kind enough to send me this, um, uh, all of the makings for the hibiscus uh, mead. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. Uh, I've never made anything with flower petals before. Uh, so I'm curious about it. I'm eager to start that. Um, uh, along with the, uh, you know, the sourwood, uh, traditional that, uh, uh, Chris had sent me some sourwood honey from Mississippi. So, but I, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to aromas and flavors, um, you know, like Chris said, I mean, it, this is an experimental type, uh, endeavor. And I don't think, I, I, I don't know that there's the perfect meat out there. Is there guys? I mean, isn't it kind of all of it? Up? <laughs> all of it, yeah. All of it. Um, tannins and mouthfeel has to play a part somewhere. Uh, you know, whether it's vanilla beans or like Chris likes to use bananas, really ripe bananas, right? Really ripe. Just when they start to get black spots, um, you know. But we're talking just a little bit. You can put a a half or three quarters of a banana mashed up with a fork into a five gallon batch. You don't get any banana flavor, but you get the mouthfeel from it. Yeah. And you can do it in primary or secondary. I usually, if I'm doing it for mouthfeel, I'll do it in primary. Um, but you know, you don't get any banana flavor at all. Yeah. And, um, uh, it's just a good way. Uh, uh, another good way to do it that uh, I know some people do is is to use raisins. Uh, I don't use raisins usually because they tend to give sort of a a venous quality to it. Venus, yeah, Venus, 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 Venus. I don't know. Google Tastes like wine. So, Damn somebody it. Google that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I hear you because I had um, uh, so, sometimes uh, you know I've had some port wines that that the first big sniff and it smells like cooked raisins. Uh, and I don't know where that comes from, but it's 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 not a smell that um, it's not a welcome kind of an aroma. It's not a it's not a smell that really smells good. So. Uh, but it might be kind of a reductive aroma. Yeah, and, and then you you you, you kind of get that raisiny, cooked raisiny, almost a almost an aftertaste to it. But uh, mm -hmm. what about using black teas? Have have you guys used any kind of? I've seen you know people put recipes up that call for the use of say that Earl Grey. Uh, you know, put a cup of dark tea in. Uh, in the batch, I put some tea in my uh, my Thai curry mead, and I did no. that. And I don't know; I haven't tasted it yet. Okay, uh, it's got about another week on the coconut. And you're, not we'll using, uh, you're not using the raw tea leaves. You're you're making a tea, and then like a like a fortify, like a really rich tea, right? And then adding that the liquid back to it, or yeah, I just I brewed up a cup of tea with a black tea bag, and then used uh, I think I used like two tablespoons or so. Yeah. And then uh, Jeff, we were talking uh, the oaking thing, and I, I really love 
a nicely oaked bourbon. Uh, I like anything. I like Chardonnay. I like. I prefer oaked Chardonnays over non-oaked. Uh, I like it in qualities of red wines. Uh, you know, and I'm really fond of oaking anything that I make. Uh, have you Have you done that uh, extensively at all, or do you make a practice of that? <laughs> Did you lose Jeff? Hello? Jeff? <laughs> Let me see if Jeff's even still here. Um, well, uh, hey guys, it's off on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oaking is kind of my go to for, um, for finishing at least like traditional or lighter body meads. Um, I don't do it very much, just kind of enough to give it a little bit of a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I find it kind of rounds out the mead nicely. It gives it a little mellow feeling to it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really go for the, the bourbon-y flavor, the, the strong oak. Just, uh, a little uh, tannin, a little um, kind of a more earthy flavor to the mead just yeah. to help round it out. I've had um, I, one of the brew shops that I frequent out here by me. They actually sell oak barrels, uh, and they're pre-treated. In other words, they've already been, uh, you know, burnt on the inside and whatnot. And I'm I'm kind of leery about doing that because I I have read a little bit about the. Uh, you know, you just can't throw a bunch of alcohol in an oak barrel and expect it to come out like a nicely taste, you know, nicely oak bourbon. Uh, you know, like, a, you know, Jack Daniels or whatever. Because it, it, there's a lot, it has a lot to do with surface area contact. Uh, and people, I've heard people even talk about cubes versus chips because of, surface area contact, spirals in place of tubes, you know, vice versa. So I'm a little leery about just, uh, you know, getting a five-gallon or a four-liter or whatever, you know, the size would be uh, and using it, uh, you know, for my mead. So, <laughs> And the other things you have to do, you do have to consider with oak are um, the – the, the species of oak, whether it's American or French or Hungarian, and the toast level of that oak. Right. Much like a good coffee, the more you toast it, the different flavors are going to come out of it. Um, as far as I understand it, you get a little bit more of that bourbony flavor from lighter toasts. Uh, from darker toasts, you get more, um, more earthy, more, uh, kind of dark and toasty notes. So yeah. there's, there's a wide array of, flavors available to you there too well and to help that uh, you know help that mouthfeel along I mean oaking is, is certainly a viable uh, you know you can use uh, that in place of using like uh, Chris likes to use grape tannins and bananas um, there's an oak powder there are oak cubes oak chips uh, and I think the bottom line is you know once you uh, once you sanitize your oak, no matter what type of uh, oaking you know you're using, uh, it's then a tasting thing. I mean, you really got to stay on top of it because it is possible to over oak, and, and like many things that we do with this meat, I mean, once you put it in, you're pretty much done. Uh, it is what it is, and uh, so I mean, and after you put your oak in, start tasting it, you know. Every day. I taste mine every single day. And sometimes it'll stay in there for a week, sometimes two weeks, sometimes a month. Uh, and then when it gets to the level that you like, pull it out, uh, you know, because it is possible to kind of overdo it. So, um, Interesting. It you know, is one, definitely possible to overdo it. And you'll know when you've overdone it and you, when you take a sip and your, your mouth kind of puckers. Around that really strong acerbic, acerbic uh, yeah. mouthfeel to it, it's it's kind of unmistakable. Yeah, Aaron, you uh, you had something. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask. So for you guys, 
you know, this is a, a little bit newer of a concept for me and, and something I haven't really experimented with that much. I mean, there, I think I had one batch several years ago where I added some, some oak and oak spiral. And I remember being pleased with the results, but, um, you know, I, I guess the question I want to throw out to, to the group here is what kind of characteristics would you look for in a mead, you know, maybe just like a traditional, say, where you would kind of say, okay, this is lacking something. I need to enhance the mouthfeel or I need to add some tannins. Like, how would you describe that mead? That like, what's it lacking? And then like, how would you go about adding it in? I know we've talked a little bit about, you know, raisins and bananas and, um, you know, some, some oak and different things like that. But, um, I guess just to go back to the original question, what, what would you say you would notice as being the most lacking from a mead where, where these enhancements would be worthwhile? Oh, uh, let's see. How did you describe it? Um, well, I would say flat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's flat. Yeah. Lacking in complexity? Yeah. Uh, un- unlively. Uh, dead. It's just... Uh, you know there's something missing, but you don't know what. Yeah. If, um, if it doesn't leave you with the wanting or the desire to pick up and have another swallow or another pour, you know. Okay. I mean, that's interesting. That's how I would describe it. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, sometimes, um, I mean, just a little bit of oak. You know, can really take a meat a long way, right, Judge? <laughs> Oak or any number of other uh, additives for that that uh, tannin content, but yeah, yeah, a little uh, a little tannin goes a long way. I, I do tend to think of this as a balance between three points of sweetness and acidity and that tannin content, and you you need a little bit of all of them and you the more body and the more like alcohol you've got in it i think a little bit more is needed for any of them body yeah that's another good way to describe it some you know uh it you know we, a, a good meat is going to have that body to it and and it's going to make it's going to it's the kind of thing where it's going to make you want to pour another glass take another sip uh mm-hmm. you know and if you don't find yourself wanting another glass or another sip, then it, it one either doesn't taste good at all or it just doesn't, it's lacking something. There's just something big time missing from it. And it okay. could be that tannin, that, that mouthfeel that leaves you feeling good. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as a party in your mouth, but uh, it's just a, it's just that good feeling that you really just, just had a drink of something wonderful, you know. Yeah, and Aaron, you can do the same thing with that as as we do with everything else we're trying to figure out. Uh, just make a identical side by side get uh, bash, you know, one gallon each. Um, use the same exact honey, do everything the same, and then when you get finished, you know, oak one of them. Uh, mm-hmm. Put some uh, medium toast. American oak or medium toast Hungarian oak. My favorite's Hungarian. Um, it infuses a little bit slower, so it's easier to control. Um, but put that in there and um, leave it for, well, a month, maybe two months, uh, and then taste them. And, and you'll see... Um, or, or you know, if you don't want to wait that long, you can you can make those two identical batches and put some grape tannin in one, and uh, give it you know a couple of weeks or so to integrate, and and you'll see what it does to it. Uh, anytime you're trying to figure something out like that, just do you know a, a one gallon batch is is cheap enough to do. Uh, do a side by side batch like that and have a control. Easiest thing in the world to to figure out the differences in things that that you don't that you're not sure of. Um, and I do it all the time. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, experimentation is key. 
I think that's it's, it's good, good to good have point. it's good to have something side by side that you can compare where you've only got one variable. Um, you know, and it's okay if you overdo it with the tannin because you're not making this thing to drink, you're making it to compare. Uh, so put enough in that you can actually detect the difference and and you can see what it what it does, you know. Mm-hmm. What qualities it adds to it. It's well making um, making me think of another good experiment to do with you know <laughs> the control and, and just all different types of things to enhance mouthfeel and, and tannins. Yep. Sure, yeah. and you can do the same thing with acid blend. If if you got any doubts about whether you want to use acid blend in the future or how it affects it, make a side by side batch and load one of them up with acid and and see if you like but, it. I mean, yeah, but be very careful. Let me tell you about acid. Be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have any acid blend and won't have. Uh, never found the need for it, but. Um, you know, I'm just giving an example of what you can, you, you can test things out like this. And this, JD and I, that we're about to do it with the coffee. We're just, uh, we don't know, uh, what we're looking for until we, uh, until we try it and see. So, uh, so we're yeah. just going to do some test batches. And, mm-hmm. you know, funny thing you should say, uh, coffee. <clears throat> Let me put my other glass. Well, actually, I got them in my notes. I, you know, on our trip, I I was kind of on a on a coffee hunt as well, uh, and I managed to come home with three different kinds of coffee. And Chris, I think I got packages. These are twelve ounce packages, so I think they're big enough. I can split in half. I'm going to send you uh, uh, half of what I got here, and you know, maybe we can use all three or or one that we find uh, might be the best. But these coffees, one is a Tanzania pea berry from the slopes of Maro. Um And I actually do have to put my other glasses on. Uh, it's a uh, harvested on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro, lively cup with full body, distinguished aroma, yet light uh, in acidity. And that was, uh, that was very important to me when I saw that. This is a medium roast coffee. The other one I picked up is a called a Kenya Double A. It's a uh, Kenya. If you go online and Google the best coffee in the world, many many times it's going to come up and tell you that the best coffee comes from Kenya. Um, this is uh, this is good stuff. Kenya Double A coffees are marked. Uh, by black currant or berry flavors with lots of structure and complexity. Uh, there's a backbone of dry red wine. So I thought that might have uh, some good, uh, uh, you know, a decent impact on our mead making experiment. Then uh, in San Diego, uh, I managed to come by this, the, uh, this winery, uh, Bernardo Winery down in, uh, in the in Poway, in San Diego County, and Manzanita uh, Brewing, or Manzanita Roasting Company, I picked up, and I, I talked to this guy, Weston, for, for quite some time, and a coffee I came back with uh, is from Costa Rica. It's from a single estate. This is an estate. In other words, it's not mixed or blended with any other bean, and it's a small estate, and they're really meticulous about picking out the green uh, beans, uh, what they call the green beans, because apparently a coffee bean needs should be bright red when it's picked. Um, and this is uh, La, La Patricia uh, Montero estate, honey, orange peel, graham cracker uh, type uh smell or whatever I guess you want to call it. it smells wonderful this is also a medium roast coffee so um, I think uh, it, I was I had been stuck on the Sumatra you and I talked before I left town for vacation and we talked at length about uh, the type of coffee that we wanted to use 
And I, I mentioned that Sumatra and Arabica were two of my absolute favorites. And uh, what was yours? Uh, the uh, Arabica, uh, I go more with the roast, uh, the Italian, dark Italian or uh, dark French roast. Yeah. And I um, think, I, you know, from what I've learned, uh, the darker the roast, the more acidic we may be getting. What, what do you think about that? Could be. And, um, you know, this is, we're talking about tannins here. Uh, we're going to be playing a, a balancing act here with tannins. This is, that's going to be one of the biggest components of this mead. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're already trying to juggle that by cold breathing. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is going to be a, a juggling act, I think. I, I think it's probably going to be one of those things like my heart murmur where you, you know, you're going to try something and then you're going to change it. And you're going to end up with four or five test batches before you zero in on what you want. Yeah. Um, I think, honestly, um, <clears throat> since we're all in this together, I think we need to get Jeff and Aaron uh, doing it, too. And since you and I are going to be sharing coffee and trying to do everything identical, we need to get Jeff and Aaron to do something with some sort of variation different from what we're doing. Yeah. And uh, so we can cover two bases at once. What do you guys think? Well, that sounds fun. Definitely. Something that, so, uh, something, something let that, them collaborate. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, something that Chris and I, you know, are, and we're both kind of new at this. And, and, you know, one, th one of the things that we did pick up on was the acidity level. It, it's coffee can be very acidic. And, I think uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the roast, the way it's roasted, and um, oh god, his name just went. Chris, what's the guy's name? Uh, uh, Emerald Lagasti. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> Emerald <I don't know. laughs> Lagasti. No. Uh, Eric Newquist. Uh, oh, Eric, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Kind of alluded uh, to something when when he was a guest on the show. You know, he was talking about the type of roasting and the acidity level. And that's what I was looking for, and I had a, a long discussion with uh, Eric, um, Eric uh, with Weston down at uh, Manzanita Roasting. Uh, was the fact that we needed a, a, a medium roasted coffee with low acidity, a low acidity bean. And, uh, he suggested two. And this Costa Rica is the one that I came home with. The other two, um, uh, and mind you, these were picked up in just a little, a, a little, uh, coffee and tea place in Old Town, San Diego. Uh, the two young ladies are there really, they don't know anything more than just selling you a bag of coffee. But uh, the uh, label on it indicates on both of them that they're both low in acidity. And that was, uh, that kind of caught my eye. So, you, well, if they're lower in acidity, we're going to be able to finish with, a, with a less sweetness. Um, yeah. Here, my, my idea for this would be. Uh, since, since JD and I have been collaborating from the beginning on this, uh, and then, like he said, we're totally new to this coffee thing, uh, why don't J, JD and I will, uh, we'll get our game plan together for what we're going to do, and then we'll send it to Jeff and Aaron, and then let Jeff and Aaron collaborate with each other to do something completely different from what we're doing, but along the same line, you know, still making a coffee mead, yeah. but choose a different roast, choose a different acidity, different sweetness level. Um, you know, you might even choose to do more or less coffee. Um, but, you know, just do a, a separate experiment, but along with us and let's, 
let's see what we like. And we'll do a bottle exchange and yeah. uh, everybody will get a bottle of each other's need and see how we like it. Are you Sounds like great coffee one. drinkers? Yeah. Jeff yeah. and Aaron, uh, are, are you both coffee drinkers? Uh, I drink oh, so much coffee. I drink so much coffee, too. <laughs> Me, too. If I'm awake, I got a cup of coffee. I keep the coffee flowing until it's time for mead. <laughs> I, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in a convention at, uh, in Las Vegas, and we uh, had a hotel not far from the hotel the convention was at. One of my friends and I were walking to this hotel at the convention, and I've got a cup of hot coffee in my hand next to me. And he goes, Jeff, you're a sick bastard. It's 105 degrees out here. How the hell are you drinking hot coffee? <laughs> drinking hot coffee. <laughs> Season and time of day has nothing to do with drinking coffee. I absolutely agree. <laughs> I am awake. I need coffee. <laughs> All right, yeah. so uh, I, yeah, I think this is going to be good, uh, a good deal. Um, and you're listening to it live here on the Mead House, so uh, this is just another reason to stay tuned. If you want to do a coffee mead, hey, pay attention, follow along with us. Uh, we may be onto something here, um, uh, you know. And uh, again, this is this is why we do this. I mean, uh, not looking to win any medals, just looking to make some good mead. Um, mm -hmm. I want to win a medal, though. You want <laughs> you want to win a medal? Well, yeah. Well, you can send it to Jeff and let him analyze it for you. Tell him, tell you whether it's sending in or not. Since we have yep. in house uh, an in house, I don't know what would you call him. Uh, Did I figure that up right? Now let's see. He won third place twice. That's the so if you reverse average that, that makes him the top one and a half yeah meat makers in the world in the world yeah I love I love the math the reverse averaging <laughs> the, the yeah. math is pretty great uh, hey, that, by the way, on, the top, on that topic um, I did get an email the other day from uh, Meatlenium which is a another meat only competition out in Silver Springs, Florida. They are looking for entries, so if anybody out there listening is interested, um, look them up. They were a great contest. Um, we we took first in category and third in show for that one. Uh, really proud of that. And I got some fantastic feedback from the judges, so I, I couldn't be happier with uh, with recommending them. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since we got Jeff talking here and he's off his mute button, Jeff is the uh, proud... I don't know, what would you call it, uh, housing authority or, or you have, you found some homeless bees that needed a place to hive, right? Well, I believe the term is keeper. Keeper. <laughs> Tell us about the bees. Well, just, I've been interested just the in bees, not the birds and the bees, just the bees. <laughs> it's not that kind of show, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've been interested in bees for a while. I mean, the, obviously, we're, we're using honey, and they, they are the source of that. But they're really complicated, really interesting creatures. And, you know, my background is in linguistics. We talk about the, the, the ridiculously complex ways that bees communicate, like food source and uh, things like that with their little waggle dances or the, the, the vibration um, and the pitch and tenor of that vibration. Um, they're very complex, very interesting little creatures. So I've been really interested in getting a hold of, uh, a couple of hives of my own one for, you know, honey, obviously. And two, just to kind of learn more about bees. Um, so we, my, my wife and I have been back and forth on this. And of course it took a little convincing because most people are scared of bees. And I think it's, Unjustly so, um, especially honeybees, because you, you've got to remember these are a livestock animal and we've been breeding them for years and years and years to be pretty docile and pretty easy to work with. Um, we, we get them confused a lot with yellow jackets and wasps and things like that that can be mean-spirited and really defensive um, unjustly, and they they have a bad rap. Um, yeah. 
but you know, I have, uh, I have a two year old and a, like three dogs and, um, they're all sharing the backyard with my two hives now. So <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, no uh, problems, right? no problems at all. In fact, um, see the only problem I've had with bees so far is that, um, well, what I bought are in, in the, the beekeeping, um, jargon is called a nuke or a nucleus. It's five frames of hive, um, with a queen and the workers and the queen's already laying eggs and they're already collecting like pollen and nectar and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a mini hive. That's a basic starter. Um, the, the problem is that the queen in one of these hives, um, started freaking out because it was such a small space. And so she decided to do what bees do when they need to reproduce, which is swarm. She yeah. basically packed up and left, um, uh, with like three little daughter cells in one of the frames so that one of these new Queens will take over her hive. Um, she didn't make it very far. She made it to my shed. Oh boy. <laughs> and specifically the little, the little gap between the window and the wall in my shed. Um, and I had a cluster there for the last two or three days in, in point of fact, last night, um, middle of the night, right before it started just pouring rain, I was out there with a little pry bar and a hammer uh, taking off a piece of the, the siding on my shed just to be able to, to get the last of those guys out because they kept coming back. I think it was the, the queen hormone, um, that was just kind of around there luring them in because I, I haven't seen the, um, evidence of her since the first night I, I kind of sucked them all up. Oh, and JD, you'll appreciate this MacGyver business. Um, I looked online and, uh, uh, as far as how to catch swarms and they use a modified, um, chop vac to do that. Really? And what I ended up doing for a trap was to use like the, uh, a plastic bucket from kitty litter, uh, <laughs> As my, my catch basin, I cut a hole for the, the shop vac and a, another hole for the tube. And, uh, <laughs> and I he put an this. inline filter for the bees. <laughs> right. This is I, stuff, dude. I used some window screen to keep them away from the, the shop vac part. Yeah. Um, and then I, <laughs> then I coated the inside of the bucket with bubble wrap so they had a soft place to land when they came through the hose. <laughs> <laughs> and I caught me a swarm of bees. You can only hear this on the Mead House. I'm telling you, the MeadHouse.com. That's out, oh, dude. That's absolutely perfect. Oh, hey, you know, I, I swear he's, to he's going to be getting another medal uh, from the Redneck Association of America. <laughs> you are now, you are now an official uh, duct tape level member. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I swear I used about half a roll on that project alone. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. Oh, my God. Yeah. If you keep going, you can work up to bailing wire level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. the next step, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So uh, how soon do you think you'll be able to collect honey? Now, it takes a while, I know. It does take a while. And I, these are new colonies. I've got a little bit of a head start because they're already laying eggs. Um yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly not certain if this queen was in that cluster or not. I just kind of, I kind of tried to do this as stress minimal for her as possible. I just kind of sucked them up. I opened up the hive she belonged in, dumped them all in, closed it back up, and let them sort it out. So I'm going to have to inspect them probably either tonight after the show or maybe tomorrow afternoon after work yeah. and uh, see how they're how they're doing. Uh, but they've got a good head start with with already being laying eggs and um, getting a, getting a colony build up. Um, generally, you harvest either after a major honey flow, and I don't I don't think we have any major crops in my part of the the town to to have a, a significant flow, or you do that at the end of the year uh, before you prefer to winterize them. Um, and I'm I'm not even sure I'm going to get a lot from. Um, a first year colony. I, my general plan for this year is to, to let them build up enough stores to survive the winter. Um, and then hopefully they'll come back strong next year and uh, be ready to really rock it out. I know um, I'm kind of an amateur photographer uh, at best. 
And there's a lake near me that I go to at least three or four times a day. It's kind of a dual purpose thing. I get my walk in uh, around this lake. And then it's also kind of a unique place because it's a kind of a wildlife preserve. So I get some pretty amazing photographs there as well. And I remember several years ago, um, I plopped my, I, I take this little, I used to take this little nylon chair with me. And uh, I'd make my walk around the lake a couple of times. And then on one day, I plopped my chair down in these very tall plants that have these little tiny little yellow flowers. And they're just, I mean, there's billions of them. And I just plopped my chair down in the middle of them, looking at the lake, looking at the shoreline across the way, the little island down in the middle, and just snapping away pictures. And then I suddenly realize I'm not alone. <laughs> and I look around, and I'm like surrounded by bees. And I mean surrounded. I mean, they're everywhere. And I'm thinking, holy crap, I'm, I'm going to be dead in an hour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I sat there for the longest time, and they paid me no never mind. I mean, they were more concerned about jumping from flower to flower than they were... You know, who, what's this big blob of flesh sitting in the middle of our flower garden? You know, so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, they're they're if if you if you just leave them alone, they're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're not going to just arbitrarily come at you and sting the crap out of you just because you think they are. Right, and realistically, if that's a wildlife preserve, those are probably feral bees that were they they went wild from being a swarm from a, a commercial crop or something like that. Um, yeah. Like the, uh, there's people with hives all over the place around there. So I mean, it may, you know, may or may not be, I have no idea, but I know every year they're there, you know, when these little yellow flowers come up, I mean, there's massive amounts of bees uh, in that one little field uh, on the, on the east side of the lake. So <laughs> and I, yesterday when I was taking my shed apart, I was, uh, I was operating completely without like any kind of veil or gloves or hat. Um, and I had zero problems with them. The yeah. biggest problem I've had so far is that, uh, Saturday afternoon I was trying to mow the lawn and I guess the, the buzz from my lawnmower was really agitating this one bee that <laughs> kept uh, chasing me around the yard. Like, Hey, Hey, back <laughs> off, back off. <laughs> that, that's as bad a situation as I've had with them so far. Well, when you get to naming them, we'll know this show has gone way too far. So. <laughs> yeah, my chickens are named. So. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Chris is, um, if I can find this, uh, deal from Chris. I don't know, what, what was the deal? You, uh, I texted you from somewhere or something. You were in San Diego. I was in San Diego, and uh, oh, we were talking about uh, food. I think I asked you how the leg and shoulder was, and you were eating some ribeye and, and potato. Taking the wife out, I guess, for Mother's Day, ribeye and potatoes. And um, and I and I, I asked you about uh, about your leg and everything. Uh, uh, leg is much better, shoulder about the same. I'm venturing back to work slowly, and I said, good, them chickens are probably sick of you by now. And then you wrote back and said uh, they've been in Corinth uh, uh, most of your downtime. Your wife has made pets out of them. And, uh, <laughs> and then I said, what, names? And you came back with, yeah, Darth Lair, Hen Solo, Yoko Ono. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Cluck Norris. Oh yeah, and and then I get this picture of his wife. Is I mean, this chicken is actually roosting on her hand, you know, like a pet bird. So yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So Chris yeah. has chickens. <laughs> yeah, they 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 have it better than I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and tell tell them about the chicken door. The chicken. Oh well, 
Yeah, just, uh, you know, to keep the foxes out, uh, you, there's always this chance that you uh, you close the door on the hen house at night and you forget to lock it. So uh, we came up with this uh, no. automatic no, 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 locker. No, 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 We? We? She. She, yeah. Yeah, okay. She came up. She. <laughs> with, a, with an automatic locking door, and I sent JD a video of it. Uh, but when it goes down, the little arms just automatically fall to the side and lock the door. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, Chris has got a pretty yeah. amazing wife. <laughs> yeah, I do. That's I awesome. Do. Um, Aaron, what's in the hopper tonight, bud? Good question. So, um, you know, a quick update on the honey varietal experiment. I was just down here in the basement inspecting everything, seeing how it's going. So three of the four have cleared pretty well. The uh, the cranberry, blueberry, and sunflower varietals are coming along pretty well, getting close to, to bottling. Um, the raspberry is fairly clear. So earlier in the discussion, I was taking some notes when we were talking about all of the different, you know, sparkaloid and bentonite and, and those types of things. I, I may need to uh, to gather something like that up here and, and put it to good use on the raspberry batch. But um, other than that, I've uh, got the, the wildflower traditional and secondary um, just kind of waiting patiently for that to clarify. And then in the hopper, in terms of a, my next batch, I'm um, still, still thinking about doing a hopped up session mead. Um, Jeff, I know we've been kind of exchanging some thoughts on that and, and I think I'm getting closer to, to coming up with the recipe there. Um, still kind of deciding whether or not to, to just go all in on one three gallon batch or split it up into to three one gallon batches. But, um, yeah, that's kind of what I got going on right now. Cool. Sounds interesting. Um, Jeff, what's in the hopper? Oh man. Um, I've got quite a bit actually. Um, obviously I have that, uh, the nutrient addition experiment. Yeah. They're all in secondary. Going? Um, they're starting to clarify. Some are a little bit clearer than others. And actually the interesting thing is I'm actually getting different, uh, different colorations out of this as well. They, they visually look different now, which is <laughs> interesting as hell. Um, and I've got a, a, a kind of a blind tasting, uh, set up for myself and some of my friends and we'll see who shows up, but we're going to be doing that on uh, June 11th. And so I'll probably get some, some nice objective feedback from that as far as uh, um, taste differences and preferences and things like that. So anything I'll be able to share standing that. Out, uh, any, any one of them standing out more than the rest at all? Honestly, I've been trying to avoid uh, more taste testing just so I don't um, unconsciously uh, what I want to say. Right. Um, before it, it comes time to taste them. But uh, I think I'm due for another racking just to get some of the sediment off of them um, shortly here because it's been, I want to say, about three, four weeks. So they're probably due for it. Cool. Um, beyond that, uh, weekend before last, I had a really busy brewing weekend um, trying to, to get back into the swing of things. I put a couple of kits in, uh, did uh, an English IPA and a Saison uh, beer kit. Then I did uh, that the Cherimoya that I've been waiting on for a good long while. Uh, I've got about a gallon and a half of that that I'm hoping will yield about a gallon if finished product, uh, just because the fruit is, uh, I want to say, kind of mushy, and I, I'm not anticipating getting all of it out of the uh, the, the rack to secondary. Um, then uh, I also have the first of two those uh, hop session meats that I put in um, doing basically the, the, uh, the one that I did last year, which was not a session meat. It was a full strength meat. Um, I more or less cut the, the honey content by half and doubled up on the hops. So it's pretty strong. Um, that's been in the, the fermenter for a little over a week now. 
and it it definitely looks hot. It's got a, a really great kind of a, a uh, olive green color to it, and um, has been bubbling away really strongly. Yeah, sounds good. Well, uh, Chris, uh, what's in the hopper there, bud? Well, I've got um, in tertiary. I've got the uh, the Thai curry is on the coconut. It'll be coming off in about a week. Yeah. Uh, I've got the heart murmur uh, clearing. It's almost ready to bottle. Um, in fact, it probably could be bottled. Um, I'm just waiting. Well, I may rack it once more because I want it to be. Uh, I don't want to have any sediment in the bottles. Um, as far as in primary, uh, I did go ahead and start the chocolate orange. I decided to do the chocolate orange first after a lot of debate. Mm-hmm. And uh, it looks like something that a Himalayan yak threw up right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. Okay. Uh, it smells great, but it looks terrible. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. I know. Uh, I, I know the heart murmur has been an ongoing project for for many many months. What uh, out of this batch? What, what's your first thoughts? What do you What are you thinking? Um. Well, I, I don't have anything to compare it to other than my own expectations, and so oh, far, yeah. uh, so like far, how, it's good. And this is like how, uh, how many batches have you done of the heart murmur? Well, I did four. I did four test batches, and then this the the fifth batch was the where I finalized it. It's a six and a half gallon uh, batch, and uh, it's. Uh, Do you think it's type? what I had expected? So this, this, type, this is this is going to be the one, then, right? This is the one. Yeah, it, yeah. I'm not doing any more experimentation because honestly, I don't know anything else to do to it. Yeah. Um, when I did the uh, fourth test batch, uh, I liked it, and I, I felt there was one small tweak that I needed to make. Yeah. So I made that, and I just went for the gold, and I said, I'm going to put together the big batch, and I did. And, uh, you know, at um, when it came out of primary, I could have I could have drank it then. Yeah, uh, I like it. So it may not be everybody's thing, but uh, I, I'm very pleased with it. I think uh, of all the meads I've made, uh, th- this has definitely got the most work in it. Probably the most ex- I, well, it is definitely the most expensive batch I've ever made. I think it's probably easy to say this is the best meat I've ever made. Yeah, perfect. So uh, I'm pleased with it. Good deal. It's well, exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, you're going to save me a bottle, right? Uh, you're all going to get a bottle. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, you're all going to get a bottle and uh, maybe two bottles. Uh, there's enough here. Uh, I'd get sick of drinking it before we drank it all. Um, uh, this is going to be something that's not going to get shared with alcoholic friends though this is uh, so this this isn't a party mead huh <laughs> this is not a party mead this is a six and a half gallon batch is about uh four hundred and seventy five dollars yeah wow. uh, and probably probably at least that much in the testing so um it's an expensive mead to make and uh i just hope it's going to be worth it i'm sure it will be I may spring for new bottles when I bottle this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! All right. Well, uh, old JD, he just—I uh, didn't start anything on purpose before we left because I didn't want to have to come home to something unusual. Uh, so nothing's changed. I still have the. The coffee mead, I haven't tasted it yet. I'm going to take a sip of it tonight and see where we're at with it. I got a funny feeling it's probably not going to be what I was expecting. It wasn't the last time I tasted it. Uh, and we're, I don't know, several weeks into into the process. Um, 
So I don't, I don't know that that's going to be uh, what I was looking for. So I think Chris and I are really on to something. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, I got the five-gallon wildflower vanilla. And I got to tell you, I took uh, I, I did a small batch uh, some months back, a long time ago. And uh, I saved uh, four bottles of to take on this trip with me. And the women folk, they loved it. This vanilla mead was awesome. And uh, so the five gallon, the big batch I've got going, same exact recipe, scaled it up. The only difference is that I, I added an oak spiral to it. Uh, and I was just looking for a little bit of oakiness. The wife loves it. And she's my biggest fan. If she likes it, then I know everybody else is going to like it because she is that particular. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting that uh, cleared up and bottled up. Uh, the five-gallon uh, Orange Blossom Traditional uh, started with uh, D47 back in September of 2015. It is still in the aging process. Um Still on a tart side, and there may be nothing that I can do about it. Uh, but I'm going to, my intention is to just let that big cardboard just set. Uh, and uh, I mean, if it takes a couple of years, it takes a couple of years. I've got a five gallon mesquite uh, traditional uh, in the carboy uh, that I started in November of 2015. Um, not real. Not real thrilled with the outcome. I don't know that that mesquite was what I was looking for because it's a straight mesquite. Mesquite, when it ferments out, is going to have this peppery, almost peppery. And no, it doesn't taste like mesquite would either. Um, hard to describe. Uh, but I'm not sure I'm going to like where this thing is going. So that's another one that's just going to sit in a carboy and see where it winds up. Uh, I got a three-gallon uh, mesquite wildflower with a light vanilla touch to it that I started uh, February, just last February. Uh, it's still in the works. Um, it's going to be a semi-sweet. And then the uh, five-gallon uh, blackberry Pinot Noir, which is ready to bottle, and uh, it'll need to sit for uh, for a length of time before it's good to drink. So that's what I, that's what I have in the hopper. So, looking forward to this uh, coffee thing with Chris. Um, and I'm eager for uh, Jeff and Aaron to uh, uh, to get started, too. And I think Chris and I, Chris, you, I think we need to have some more discussion. And let's really nail down our plan, our method, and our, and our recipe. Because it's going to come down to, and this is something that Chris and, and I mean, that uh, Jeff and Aaron might want to consider uh, the amount of coffee, cold brew coffee, um, that you're going to need to steep with. That this is the so They may want to. They may even want to do a hot brew if they're going to do something yeah. totally different than what we do. Uh, you know, this is all about experimenting and comparing. So um, that's true. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, that's going to be up to them. Let them uh, collab. We'll, when we we get our process and, and method nailed down, we'll email uh, Jeff and Aaron both a copy exactly what we're going to do, and then the two of you collaborate and come up with something that's a different version of it, test some different variables, and then we'll all swap bottles and see see who came up with the best. Yep. I like the sounds of that. I, I've got to tell you, when we had Eric Newquist on, we were talking about coffee beads. Uh, definitely my ears perked up. And as we were talking about earlier, I think we've got four big coffee fans here. And, and uh, to me, it just sounds like an interesting flavor to kind of meld in with that mead flavor. 